I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about the concept of treating postmenopausal women with male hormone, with androgen, with testosterone. Does it make any sense? Well, it's being done with increasing frequency these days. But the question is, safe or not, effective or not, placebo or not. First of all, the ovary during the premenopausal years manufactures not only estrogen, but testosterone as well. As a matter of fact, it has to manufacture the testosterone, which is then converted into estrogen. The adrenal gland that sits on top of the kidney also manufactures some substances. It manufactures DHEA and androstenedione, and those chemicals in different cells in the body are converted both to male hormone and female hormone. And as an idea of how important the adrenal gland production is, it's responsible for the pubic hair that develops in a six or seven or eight year old girl. It's not the ovary. The ovary is still asleep, hasn't even begun to work. And as a matter of fact, over a period of time, we're learning more about the adrenal gland. Just in 2016, several new hormones that it produced were discovered. And that's going to change the landscape going down the road. But if we look at a woman who's about 70 or 80 years old, she's only manufacturing about 10 or 20 percent of the DHEA that a woman age 20 is producing. So over time, going to have a significant decline in adrenal gland production of these hormones. Now that might be important because those chemicals, remember, manufacture testosterone and estrogen. And remember, estrogen has been linked to cancer of the womb. It's been linked to breast cancer in adult women. Well, if we look at the course of a lifetime, say from age 20 to 75, we're going to find that the hormone levels consistently decline. So the testosterone level is going to go down, the DHEA is going to go down, the androstenedione is going to go down, and they're going to go down independent of the perimenopausal years and the early menopause. So neither the perimenopause nor the early menopausal years are specifically going to impact on the hormones. There is no drastic change in these androgenic hormones. If we look at a woman who is 40 years old, and compare the testosterone level that she has compared to a 20-year-old woman, it's already fallen by about 50%. It's not going to significantly change, as I mentioned, during the perimenopausal years unless a woman has her ovaries removed, in which case the testosterone that's measured in the blood is going to fall by about 50%. Now, the question always has arisen. Is the testosterone necessary for women to give a boost to the libido or the drive or the energy? And that's a question right now. So the primary source when we get to the postmenopausal years of these male hormones is going to be number one, the ovary. Yes, the ovary, even though it's not going to manufacture the estrogen any longer, it is still going to manufacture testosterone. And of course, the adrenal gland is going to produce the androstenedione and the DHEA that's going to be converted in the fat cells and in the bone cells and in the vascular cells and in the brain cells into male hormone and also, of course, female hormone. Well, in order for the male hormone to work, it has to work through a receptor a cell in some area of the body has to be able to take that hormone out of the bloodstream and make the cell do something, change the DNA in the cell. And if we look for the androgen receptor, we find it in an awful lot of areas. We find it in the breast and the heart and the blood vessels and the gastrointestinal system. We find it in the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nerves. It's also going to be present in the bladder and the uterus and the ovaries. It's going to be present in the synovial cells, it's going to be present in the fat, going to be present in the muscles. And the male hormone itself, given an adequate quantity, which isn't necessarily good for a woman, but in an adequate quantity, the male hormone, of course, is going to increase the bone density, it's going to alter the fat distribution, it's going to increase the muscle strength and the muscle mass. It's going to make more red blood cells 
and of course it's going to change the level of sexual desire. Well, if we look at the symptoms of androgen deficiency, part of the reason it's being diagnosed so much is the symptoms are absolutely nonspecific. Everybody's going to suffer some of these symptoms. So it's anxiety or depression or irritability or lack of well-being or maybe a sensation of fatigue or some bone loss or some muscle loss or a change in the memory, a change in your cognition or maybe some insomnia, maybe heart failure, or maybe some joint pains. Well, those are signs and symptoms of just growing old. And of course, postmenopausal women are going to suffer from anxiety and moodiness and insomnia and lack of well-being and all of those same symptoms that everyone seems to have. But in women, those symptoms are now being increasingly said to be caused by a decrease in the testosterone. However, there is no deficiency level that has been defined. There is no testosterone deficiency syndrome. We're talking about symptoms that probably half of the women have. And if we look overall, there's no correlation between the level of the hormones floating around in the bloodstream and symptoms that people are going to have. So they did a big study in Australia and they looked at the concentration of the serum male hormones and they compared them to sexual desire and sexual satisfaction and that they found there was absolutely no correlation. So what causes low level of sexual desire in postmenopausal women? Lots of things. Maybe it's depression or chest pain, or maybe it's a headache or a fatigue or a thyroid abnormality, or maybe it's just overwork. Maybe it's some problems with a relationship. Maybe it's really the husband or the sexual consort that needs a little bit of testosterone to treat some of the erectile dysfunction, or more likely it's going to be Viagra or one of those similar substances. Or maybe just the lack of estrogen in the woman has caused some dryness of the vaginal tissues, which then leads to pain during sexual activities. Well, some people say, no, we have an adrenal deficiency syndrome. We have the adrenal gland not working well, and it's not producing the hormones but there's no evidence for that. There are no reference standards, there's no defined disease. Well, then some people say, okay, if it's not the androgen, I mean, I'm sorry, the adrenal deficiency disorder or syndrome, maybe it's the female androgen deficiency syndrome. So they tried to make that into a disease. Everybody's trying to make diseases. They tried to do that with some representatives of America and Australia, they got together some experts weren't able to come up with a diagnosis. And actually, again, we find about 50% of women are going to have these kind of symptoms, not necessarily even after the menopause. Well, if you happen to use some of these diagnoses that people make up, one of them is hypoactive sexual desire disorder. So if a woman doesn't want sex, that now means you have a disease. It's a psychiatric disease, supposedly. Well, some drug companies tried to get the Food and Drug Administration to accept testosterone therapy for this relatively newly made up condition. And the FDA looked at all of the evidence and said, show us some safety studies, show us some efficacy studies. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't appear that the hypoactive sexual desire disorder is a hormone-related problem, at least not hormone in the standard way that we think about them. So let's say we give women some androgen, we give them some male hormone, we give them some of the DHEA, or we give them some of the testosterone. Are there any side effects? Well, there certainly can be. Some of the side effects include thinning of the hair on your head, growing hair on your face, acne, deepening of the voice, depending on the kind of testosterone, sometimes some liver changes. There's a question about cardiovascular safety, a change in the lipoproteins. And remember that since testosterone is going to be altered in the body to estrogen, it's certainly possible that taking testosterone could increase the likelihood of developing either breast or uterine cancer. Well, what are some of the thoughts? One of the areas, one of the groups that thinks a lot about this is called the Endocrine Society. The Endocrine 
doctors, the specialists in the area, and they evaluated giving postmenopausal women male hormone, and they said, no, absolutely not, no indications, there's no level of long-term security, there are no studies done, and as a matter of fact, women often will get a supra-physiologic level, get too much, and that then can theoretically increase the risk of the breast cancer and the endometrial cancer and the blood clots and the stroke. So that's obviously not a good idea. And you should realize that all of the male hormones that are now being prescribed for women are off-label. The Food and Drug Administration has not approved any single one of them for women. And as a matter of fact, there are no dosing guidelines. Remember, women have only about one-tenth of the hormone level, the male hormone level, and all of the preparations are geared for treating men, not for women. And we don't have any stu studies looking at some of the side effects. Well, as I mentioned before, the Food and Drug Administration already evaluated the situation and said no, but the European Medicines Agency which is like the FDA but over in Europe, they studied the subject in 2006 and said, well, okay, we'll let you put some topical testosterone-containing preparations on the market to treat some of these situations, especially the hypoactive sexual desire disorder. And what happened? Well, very shortly after they approved them, one of the products was taken off the market for commercial reasons, and another product, well, it was being studied for cardiovascular safety and just all of a sudden they terminated the study and got rid of the medicine. So that should tell you something. And in 2015, the Food and Drug Administration caused a warning label to be placed on all male hormone products, saying that they could increase the risk of heart attack and stroke. Okay, so given all of that, testosterone gel to the skin? Is it going to increase the number of sexually satisfying exposures that a woman has over the course of a month? None or less than one. Well, they looked at women who were in their early years, they were between the ages of maybe about 45 and maybe about 65 or 70. They had no complaints about sex. They were being treated with estrogen, and then they were given a boost. They were given a shot of male hormone. Did it help? Not really. And, and the little bit of help was only at the highest level that caused other kind of problems. Well, it's important to realize that we have all these testosterone patches. Patches are the big thing in medicine these days, because what happens when you put a patch on the surface of the skin and the medicine goes on the skin instead of in the mouth, then we don't have some of the metabolic changes that are going to occur in the liver because when it goes to the mouth, first thing happens, goes to the liver and gets changed. So some of these topical containing patches were applied. Now the women were also getting estrogen. So what happened to these women? Well, the women who got the estrogen and testosterone had a 250% increase in their incidence of breast cancer the women who were getting the estrogen and progesterone, the typical hormone replacement therapy, they had a small increase in the risk of breast cancer. And women who were getting neither, well, they didn't have any increase in the risk. Well, so we've already said that from a heart standpoint, probably doesn't make sense. How about from cognitive function? Is it going to improve your memory? Is it going to improve your sense of overall well-being? Is it going to improve your mood? No evidence that that's the case. How about, will it improve your body composition? Will it be able to get you thinner, cause you to lose some of the fat that seems to accumulate after the menopause? Again, the answer is, no, nah, not really, not at safe doses. Well, how about, let's bypass the male hormone completely and let's go to some of those supplements that have the DHEA that you can get actually at the grocery store, at the pharmacy, or at the health food store. Does DHEA by itself, is that going to do something beneficial? And the answer is no, not really. Actually, it's been studied and it was shown not to, repeat, not to increase the sexual function, not to increase the sense of wellness or cognitive function or the quality of life or the body composition or the physical performance. 
even in people who had low baseline levels, even in those 70 and 80 year old women who otherwise had relatively low levels, not helped. And as a matter of fact, when you get some of these supplements, you really don't even know what's in the supplements because the supplements have not been shown by the FDA or shown to the FDA or had evidence presented to the FDA that they're either safe or effective. They're allowed to be marketed as supplements without any kind of legitimate testing. So the bottom line is male hormone replacement for postmenopausal women. Is it a good idea to take androgen? Is it a good idea to take testosterone? Well, the people who have evaluated say no, doesn't seem to make any sense. There's no scientific justification for it in the overwhelming majority of women. Remember, there's a lot of quackery going on and just think, if you're trying to increase your sense of well-being, your mood, your level of sexual activity, is losing hair on your head and growing it on your face and getting some pimples and a deep voice really the way that you want to go? Anyway, something for you to consider. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.